All right, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Parker, and I'm a member of the marketing team at the Perry Johnson Companies, and I'll be helping facilitate today's webinar and offer support to our speakers. Uh, we do have Rachel with us on the line here, who's a member of our PJRFSI team, if you want to say hi. Hi, everyone. All right, and with that, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Liz Cox of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the title of this presentation is a, a Proposition 12 update. And as I move through the presentation, I really focused on um, requirements of what are defined as distributors um, in our regulatory framework for implementation of Prop 12. And if you have questions um, at the end of the presentation, will be an opportunity for any of your written questions submitted. Um, we'll read them out and, and be able to, I'll be able to answer them. And also at the end of this webinar, I'm gonna review our website as well um, as a place to find more information on Prop 12. So here's an outline of what I'm gonna review on this presentation. So just a, a few introductions as a review of um, Prop 12 and the regulations. And then I'm going to review the definition of commercial sales and review the definitions of the different covered products that fall under Prop 12, uh, a review of the regulatory framework, and then specific requirements of distributors. And then, as I mentioned, we'll flip over to the, to the website where you can find more information. Right, so the animal care program, that's the name of the program that's in charge of implementing Proposition 12. We are within the Animal Health and Food Safety Services Division uh, here at the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And so what we're working under our authority is the Prop 12, which is under the Health and Safety Code, and then also the Animal Confinement Regulations which are the regulations that were promulgated to implement Prop 12. So when you read anything related, communications, our website, anything about the animal care program, that's Prop 12 here in California. Okay, so Prop 12, the law is within Health and Safety Code here in California. It became law through a ballot initiative that was passed in 2018 by California voters. And it has two, two big categories of prohibited activities. Uh, the first one is uh, the specific uh, confinement of certain covered animals here in California as far as um, basically setting up minimum standards for how egg laying hens, veal calves, and breeding pigs are kept on farms here in California. That's one of the big one of the big parts of Prop 12. And then the other big part of it, which is what I'm going to focus on for this presentation, is that it prohibits the sale in California of covered products um, if those covered products are from an animal that was not kept in the way um, that the law describes in regards to the minimum standards. And here I copied and pasted from the health and safety code um, that specific part. So it says a business owner or operator shall not knowingly engage in the sale within the state of any of the following. And then it lists the four different covered products. So it's the whole veal meat, whole pork meat, shell eggs and liquid eggs, if they are known to have been raised according to um, what's considered confined in a cruel manner, which is defined in the law. Basically what this means is that the covered products sold in California need to come from animals that are raised according to the Prop 12 minimum standards. And I just bring this up because that's um, you know, a question we get a lot is what is a sale? What is a covered product? Hey, this specific example of what I'm selling, does it fall under Prop 12? Um, and so that's what part of what I'm gonna be going through today is to help you guys understand what does fall under Prop 12 
and then also where to find more information on our website if you still have questions. So the animal confinement regulations, um, those were uh, finalized and went into effect September 1st of 2022. And these regulations were written uh, you know, and, and developed after the passing of, of Prop 12. As far as Prop 12 gave us these, 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 these final requirements of um, how the animals are confined and prohibiting sales of certain products. Um, but they don't, the law doesn't explain really how to get there and how to ensure that, um, they're, that the consumers of California are purchasing the products that they voted for and really to ensure we have a, a fair marketplace. So that's why we developed the regulations. They are modeled after USDA's national organic program as far as having um, different uh, types of operations that are certified, certain operations that need to register, and then CDFA, Cal the state of California having a role of accrediting um, certifying agents. And so again, these regulations went into effect September 1st of 2022. Okay, so commercial sale, this is this is the big one as far as I mentioned what Prop 12 prohibits is the confinement, certain confinements here in the state of California, and then also prohibits the sale of certain covered products as far as thinking um, now the covered products have to be from animals kept according to the minimum standards. So commercial sale, we clarified this in our regulations, and this is you know, slide one of three as far as I, I split it up for, for understanding. So what a commercial sale, that means to sell, exchange, barter, trade, transfer title or possession or distribute, conditional or otherwise in California commerce, including but not limited to transactions by a retailer with a consumer and electronic transactions made using the internet. And um, throughout this presentation, I, I highlight if, when we have other guidance on our, docu on our um, website. So we do have a uh, sales guidance document. And so this is the first part of commercial sales saying everything that it includes. Um, but there are things that are excluded from the definition of commercial sale. So commercial sales shall, shall not include the following transactions or transfers of possession, which apply only to the specific transaction listed below, but not to the covered product itself. And therefore this exemption does not apply to all subsequent commercial sales of covered product. So um, as far as what's listed here in the next two bullet points, it's saying that um, these examples of transactions do not fall under the definition of commercial sale, but it's just that specific transaction. And so then if the covered product then continues to move through the supply chain, um, subsequent sales do fall under the definition of commercial sale. So this exemption, um, as far as these two bullet points, only applies to that specific transaction of the covered product. So the first one there is the sale of shell eggs or liquid eggs, which is undertaken at the premises of an official plant, which is under mandatory inspection um, by FSIS under the Egg Products Inspection Act. So this would be you know, establishments that are um, issued in an establishment number from USDA with the prefix of G. And then the other are is any sale of whole pork or veal meat undertaken on the premises of an establishment in which mandatory inspection is provided by FSIS under the Federal Meat Inspection Act. So these would be establishments that um, have been issued the establishment number from USDA with a prefix of M. It also does not include um, covered product produced outside of the state that enters and exits California without additional processing or repackaging exclusively for purposes of transshipment or export out of the state. Um, so, you know, what this means, especially you know, thinking of California being a, a port state, is that non-compliant covered product can move through the state. So it can come into the state, perhaps it's held at a warehouse uh, before it goes onto in a shipping container 
onto a ship to then be exported. That, that's allowed the non-compliant product just moving through the state. Does not include any sale made directly to federal agencies or takes place on federal lands located within the state, you know, for example, military bases. Um, any sale of covered product which takes place on tribal lands, uh, that is not considered a sale under Prop 12. And then also donations to nonprofit organizations that have a tax exemption. So a donation, um, for example, to a food pantry, if it's non-compliant covered product coming into the state that, then's gonna, that then will be donated to a food pantry, um, that is not considered a sale and can be of non-compliant product. Okay, and then covered products. So when I say covered product, you know, that's my general, general phrasing in regards to um, the four products that are listed here. So shell eggs, I'm sorry, I've been talking a lot the last couple of days. Shell eggs, liquid eggs, whole veal meat, and whole pork meat. And so why is it these covered products? These are the four that are um, listed in the health and safety code under Prop 12. And so these four um, are summarized here, and then I'm gonna go into each one in a little bit more detail. Okay, <clears throat> so the first one is shell eggs, which means whole egg of an egg laying hen in its shell form intended for human food. This brings up a good point with Prop 12, a question that we sometimes, we've received many times is about um, any of these covered products that are for pet food. And so Prop 12 does not cover um, anything for pet food. So thinking eggs coming into California um, with the intention or pork meat or veal meat that it's gonna be for pet food, then no, that doesn't um, fall under Prop 12, doesn't need to be Prop 12 compliant. And so in our regulations, we clarified what in its shell form means for the purposes of shell eggs. And um, it does include whether it is um, raw, pasteurized in the shell, treated in the shell, hard boiled, otherwise cooked in whole form, peeled, um, co-packaged with other foods, or sold as sliced, chopped, or otherwise cut. So this is another common question we get. I mean, certainly <clears throat> you think about the shell eggs in a carton that you buy at the store. Yes, those need to be prop total compliant. And then also I have a picture there of the hard cooked eggs. So hard, hard boiled eggs, hard cooked eggs also fall under prop 12 under the definition of shell egg, whether they're hard cooked in the shell, peeled um, or chopped or sliced. Okay, and then the second category of covered product is liquid eggs. And so the regulations clarify that what liquids, it, what liquid eggs, what does that mean? And it means basically everything under the Egg Products Inspection Act. So the liquid eggs can be in a liquid form, frozen, dried, freeze dried, they can be separated, Oh, it's just egg white. Oh, it's only egg yolks. Oh, it's been mixed into new proportions of egg white and egg yolk. All of that falls under the definition of liquid egg. Um, it also includes whether it's raw or pasteurized, um, cooked, cooked as a patty, a puck, or some other kind of cooked form. Um, all of that uh, would fall under, so again, if it's just a, a folded egg or it's just a, a cooked egg patty, yes, the sale of that product, um, that would be a covered product. And then you can see there on the third bullet point, you know, any product or mixture of products um, specified in this subsection to which has been added no more than sugar, salt, salt, water, seasoning, coloring, flavoring, preservatives, stabilizers, or other similar food additives. And again, we're happy to answer any specific questions that come up. Um, in regards to products that you make or, or sell or buy here in California. Um, but thinking about potentially like a scrambled egg mix in general, all of those, yes, that's gonna fall under the definition of liquid egg because it's just the liquid egg plus salt, seasoning, and preservatives. 
Okay, and we do have a guidance document on our website. Um, this is a screenshot of it. So this is a flow chart to help you, you know, start at the top and then work through all the different um, questions as far as deciding whether the product that you're specifically thinking about would fall under the definition of a shell egg or a liquid egg. And then you can see the species there listed to the side. It's chicken eggs, which of course is the majority, but then also would include um, duck eggs for human consumption, geese, guinea fowl, and turkey. Okay, so we have the shell egg and liquid eggs, and then the other um, categories are the pork meat and veal meat. And for the purposes of this uh, presentation, I, I pulled language that explains pork meat, but all the same principles are going to apply to veal meat as well. So whole pork meat, this means any uncooked cut of pork, um, and then including and it lists uh, examples of several different cuts, of um, cut examples, and then it says, except for the seasoning, curing agents, coloring, flavoring, preservatives, and similar meat additives. So again, what's important to think about what is, you know, what is whole pork meat under Prop 12? It needs to be meat, um, it needs to be uncooked, and it needs to be um, a cut that is, that we further clarified in regulation. And so that's where, you know, we provided guidance, but if you can't, Again, when I get specific questions on some new cut of pork that I've never heard of, that's what I always follow as well. Is it uncooked? Is it meat? Um, and does it fall under the definition of cut? And so just like with the eggs, it says, you know, except for seasoning, curing agents, coloring, flavoring, preservatives, and similar meat additives. So what this in reality means is if you have, um, you know, a marinated pork tenderloin, for example. It's it's raw. Um, it's a it's a cut. It's pork, but it's it's in a marinated, you know, vacuum sealed bag. Yes, that would be a covered product under Prop 12 because it's the uncooked cut of pork. Plus, the only other additions are the seasoning, curing agents, flavoring, and preservatives. So, a marinated, uncooked cut of veal or pork would fall under Prop 12. Okay, so meat, <laughs> we all can probably think of a pork chop as, you know, pork tenderloin, those are things we all know, but certainly there's um, all parts of the animal is used. So this is another question that we commonly get is, hey, does this specific cut from a pig fall under Prop 12, and so this is what, you know, I'll always go back to, and this is what I refer people to. So pork meat, as far as how it's uh, defined in the Health and Safety Code of Prop 12, it, it references um, this, this section of the California Code of Regulations, which was, you know, already established before uh, Prop 12 came to be, and so meat means any part of the muscle of cattle, sheep, swine, goats, or fallow deer that is skeletal or that is found in the tongue, in the diaphragm, in the heart, or in the esophagus um, with, or with or without the bone, skin, all the attach attaching parts. Um, it does not include the muscle found in the lips, snout, or ears. So thinking about, you know, I get questions, hey, um, what about awful? So is awful, does that fall under Prop 12? Well, we just have to make sure we're on the same definition of what awful means. So here, heart, yes, that is um, covered under Prop 12, but yeah, liver, no, stomach, no, intestines, no. Um, so sometimes, you know, as far as how we answer questions, we just have to rely on what the regulations say. And then, you know, does not include snout or ears, okay, so that's very obvious and specific. Uh, people ask, do tails, pigtails fall under Prop 12? No, they don't because it's not muscle, it's just bone and skin and tendons. Do pig feet fall under Prop 12? No, because it's not muscle, it's just bones, again, skin and tendons. So as far as um, if you have something, I think I've probably answered all the parts of the pig, 
But again, that's how we get to our answer is, is, is using uh, what's already been established as the definition of meat and regulation. Okay, and then the other part is cut. So um, remember it's, it's uh, whole pork meat is uncooked cuts of pork or um, same you know, logic follows for veal. And so we clarified in regulation what cut means um, in the sense of it, the statute does list some examples, but there's obviously a lot more. And so in regulation, we, we reference um, already established uh, standards. So the USDA's fresh pork series uh, for veal, it's the USDA's fresh veal series, and then also the industry-wide cooperative meat identification standards. So anything that falls under a, a cut under those um, you know, identity standards, yes, then that is going to be a cut under Prop 12. And then here in bold at the bottom, we did clarify in regulation, but shall exclude any ground or otherwise comminuted meat products. Um, so ground pork or ground veal, that does not fall under um, Prop 12. Uh, and the way that that's clarified here in regulation is through the definition of cut. So if it's just a package of ground pork, no, that doesn't fall under Prop 12, or then thinking about, you know, sausages, if it's uncooked sausages made with ground pork and seasoning, uh, no, that would not be a covered product um, under Prop 12 because it's made out of ground. Okay. And then the uncooked part of the definition. So again, it's, um, you know, Whole pork meat is uncooked cuts of pork. So then in our regulations, we clarified what does uncooked mean um, as far as, you know, it, to fall under Prop 12 and be a covered product under Prop 12, it needs to be uncooked. And basically, you know, we, through the regulations, clarify that, you know, anything that is ready to eat out of the packaging from a food safety perspective meaning it's not required to bear the safe handling instructions, which is required for non-ready-to-eat products by the um, Code of Federal Regulations. So anything that is ready to eat out of the packaging would not, does not fall under Prop 12. So here I have an example of the, the spiral honey-baked ham. Um, yes, if that's already been um, processed and what's being sold is the honey baked ham that's ready to be can, granted we might uh, warm it up for flavoring purposes but from a food safety perspective can just just be consumed then no that doesn't fall under prop 12. the second picture there is a you know lunch meat no that would not fall under prop 12. the third example there is you know italian cured meat so from a food safety perspective, as far as how we label, you know, products under the CFR, that is a ready to eat meat um, and that you can just, you know, slice it and eat it. No, that doesn't fall under Prop 12. And then the last one there is the bacon. So bacon that you're going to buy in the refrigerated part of the grocery store that's ready to cook. Yes, that bacon has potentially been smoked or cured, but that bacon is ready to cook and that it needs to be cooked from a food safety perspective. Yes, that bacon falls under Prop 12, but the picture here in the presentation of fully cooked bacon that can be consumed straight out of the package or you know, put on your BLT or something like that, um, no, that, that does not fall under Prop 12. So again, what's the line? The line is um, ready to eat from a food safety perspective. And I just want to emphasize um, this uncooked, ready to eat um, decision of if it's a covered or not, if it's covered or not under Prop 12, that only applies to the pork and the veal. When we think about the shell eggs and the liquid eggs, doesn't matter if it's ready to eat, doesn't matter if it's cooked. Um, so I just, you know, sometimes that gets, we just, I just want to make sure that's clear. When we're talking about things ready to eat out of the packaging, 
um, and the context of Prop 12, that's just the pork and veal meat. And we do have guidance again on our website. Here's a screenshot of it for the pork and veal, um, as far as your kind of decision tree of, of, of trying to figure out if a product um, does fall under Prop 12. And then if you still have questions, you can always feel free to reach out. All right, so now I'm going to move on to the regulatory framework. So the regulations, um, they establish this regulatory framework for how we will implement Prop 12. And as I mentioned, they're modeled after the USDA's National Organic Program. This is a screenshot of our regulatory framework for eggs. Um, and we have one of these for veal and also for pork on our website, very, very similar. Um, same framework, but you know, just different language used um, because from a producer perspective, you know, an egg producer is usually just an egg producer and not necessarily also a pork producer. So let's just start there at the top. Um, you can see it starts with egg producer and there's a number one. This guidance document is a two page guidance document. And so the numbers here on this screenshot, they correspond to the, the second page of, on the guidance document as far as um, uh, defining what's happening at that point in the, in the supply chain. So here the regulatory framework starts at a producer. Producers are required to be certified. Um, that certification could be provided by, you know, for example, for Perry Johnson. So it can be provided by an accredited certifying agent or um, CDFA or another recognized government entity. And that certification is required by January 1st of 2024. And then just moving through the supply chain, you can see how it moves, um, you know, can move to a shell egg processing plant might move through to a breaking plant if it's liquid eggs or thinking about if this is whole veal meat or whole pork meat, it would move through you know, slaughter and fabrication. Um, then moving down the supply chain, um, you see the, the blue seal that says state of California um, and that's symbolizing our California agricultural border protection stations. So California, we're a big consumer of, of pork and all of these products, um, but we do import most of them from out of state. So that means that, you know, liquid eggs, pork meat, they are coming on trucks from outside of California, coming into California to then be sold and consumed here within the state. And they're gonna pass through our border stations. It's already an established, um, you know, uh, checkpoint that we have that's managed under CDFA. And so there are requirements for shipping documents, which I'll review, but as far as in this kind of flow of the supply chain, that's what that checkpoint is, is that at the border stations, um, you know, trucks, the paperwork um, for trucks that are bringing covered product into the state, there's certain requirements for what's on that paperwork. And that's um, one of the places where that would be checked is when the trucks come into the state. And then further moving down um, this schematic, then it goes to registered egg distributors. And so this is the egg distributors or just the level of distribution. That's the main focus um, where CDFA is focused in regards to our implementation, implementation and how we're regulating to ensure um, that only compliant products are in commerce here in California. And it's based on how distributor is defined in our regulations. And a distributor is gonna be distributing or selling covered product to an end user here in California. And so those distributors, whether they're distributing eggs, pork or veal, um, are required to register with CDFA and then they too are required to be third party certified. Again, the same as the egg producers, they can be certified by a Perry Johnson, who's an accredited certifying agent, or they can be certified by CDFA or another recognized government entity. And um, that certification 
is required after July after January 1st of 2024 and then renewed annually. And then the final step there in the regulatory framework, those are the end users, and that's defined in our regulations. Um, and that helps us, helps you understand where do I fit in? Am I an end user or am I a distributor? Um, distributors obviously have a lot more in that they need to register, they need to be third party certified. So as far as understanding where you fit in our regulatory framework, distributors are selling or distributing to end users in California. And then of course the end user, um, you know, they're, they're, they're important in that they are the ones, you know, buying the covered products. So of course that, that is considered a sale. Um, so, you know, end users thinking about restaurants, um, thinking about um, retail locations, you know, they're wanting to ensure they're buying covered, uh, compliant covered product. And the best way to do that, um, is buying from a registered distributor at best way. That's probably the easiest way, I guess I would say to do it because all of the, the paperwork and certification then is, is held at the level of the distributor and you as an end user, if you're buying from a registered distributor, then that can be a defense of, hey, yeah, no, I'm, I'm obeying the law. I'm buying compliant product because I'm buying from a registered distributor. Okay, so the shipping document markings I did mention briefly, but I wanted to go over it again and just point out that there is more guidance on our, our website. So the shipping document markings, you can see there's specific statements depending on the type of covered product. So a statement for egg, different one for veal and for pork. And this specific statement is required to be on all documents of title and shipping documents accompanying the covered product transported into and within California. So yes, I mentioned the border protection stations that would look at paperwork, look at BOLs to have the specific statement of, you know, eggs coming into the state, but also, you know, the way this reads is it's, it's all documents of title and shipping um, manifests that are accompanying the product. So, you know, what the distributor in California brings in, yes, it should have the specific marking, uh, what the distributor sends out from their distribution warehouse in California, you know, sent to retail stores, sent to restaurants. Yes, that also should, the statement needs to be on those shipping documents as well. And then thinking about any, um, I don't know if there were in between, in between as well, thinking about we do have, we've learned, you know, distributors that sell to other distributors. Um, then it would be required on those shipping documents as well. Just any, any covered product that's moving into or within the state um, is required to have this statement. And then as I mentioned in the definition of commercial sale, non-compliant covered product is allowed to um, be transshipped through the state of California um, for the purposes either of export or maybe it's moving through California to then go to another state. Um, or with the other exceptions, perhaps it's going to uh, be sold on tribal lands or going to a military base, um, then that not, if that product is non-compliant, then it would need to have one of these other statements, either for export, for transshipment, or not Prop 12 compliant. And then in bold there at the bottom, um, no product labeling specific to Prop 12 is required. So shipping document markings, these specific statements, that is for the paperwork accompanying the shipments. There's no specific requirement under our regulations or under the Prop 12 law that says you have to label the product, the actual you know, consumer packaging, labeling the actual product with a certain statement. You would be, oh, you're allowed to do that if you choose to as a business label product. Um, you would just, that would be voluntary. Um, you would have to go through whatever um, already established rules there are for labeling product if it's you know, an FSIS product um, regulated under USDA. And then also it would, if you make any sort of label claim relevant to California's Prop 12, there would have to be truth in um, that claim. And so our regulations do clarify that. So for example, if 
if eggs are labeled as cage-free, they're not required to be labeled as cage-free, but if they are labeled to be cage-free, then that, that cage-free would need to be equivalent. That needs to mean the cage-free as defined in, in Prop 12. Okay, so here's our regulatory framework again with um, upcoming deadlines. So distributors as defined in the regulations, so egg, pork, and veal distributors were required to be registered with CDFA by January 1st of 2023. We are still accepting applications. Um, the application to register as a distributor is on our website. And then, um, the next, the upcoming deadline is January 1st of 2024. So by that deadline, producers are required to be third party certified um, for compliance with the law and regulations. So January 1st, 2024, producers are required to be certified by that date. So they have right now until if they aren't certified yet, um, right now until December 31st to obtain their third party certification, excuse me, as a producer. And that, again, would either be issued by like a Perry Johnson, so an accredited certifying agent um, by CDFA or another recognized government entity. And then distributors are required. Um, so after January 1st of 2024, distributors are required to have a third party certification when they either um, apply for a new registration with CDFA or when they um, apply for renewal. And again, it's renewed every 12 months. Oh, I guess I should also say, you know, this, I'll repeat it again, but the certification for a producer or for a distributor um, is renewed every 12 months as well. So registration is renewed every 12 months and certification is renewed every 12 months. Um, so establishments that are under, so within that regulatory framework, so slaughter and fabrication um, or breaking plants, so any establishments under mandatory inspection um, under the Federal Meat Inspection Act, um, they are not required to register as a distributor. Um, these types of establishments can voluntarily register with CDFA, but there isn't a requirement. So in thinking about the regulatory framework, it you know moving from either a breaking plant or a slaughter plant, then to a distributor, then to an end user. We know we recognize everything doesn't always flow exactly like that, and that some some products do move directly from slaughter from an FSIS plant directly to an end user, like a retail store. Um, in that case, um, you know by definition, the slaughter plant is a distributor. Um, in that they're selling or distributing to an end user, except that there's the, there's the exemption in Prop 12 for any sales that occur at an establishment under mandatory FSIS inspection. So in that case, um, just to clarify, you know, those types of establishments are not required to register as distributors. They can voluntarily, if they'd like to register, the slaughter plant or breaking plant could, but they're not required to register. Okay, so for, for, for this um, presentation, I, I just wanted to further explain who's a distributor and the requirements of distributors. So again, the regulations define it as either an egg, veal, or pork distributor. I have pulled from the regulations the example for pork. So a pork distributor is a person or facility engaged in the business of commercial sales or distribution of whole pork meat as a pork producer otherwise to an end user in California. And this definition shall not apply to a person or facility that only receives whole pork meat as an end user. So again, you know, in our in your general conversations day to day, distributor might mean a lot, might pertain to a lot of different types of businesses, but in regards to Prop 12, who needs to register, um, who's gonna have to be certified, it's it's the distributor and that's defined as whoever is a person or business that's selling or distributing to the end user in California. 
And so end users, um, it's important to know this as far as where do you fall? Are you a distributor or are you an end user? Um, so an end user, is it a consumer or it can be a retail location that is not a producer and only conducts commercial sales directly to a consumer without any further distribution? End user is also a food processing facility or cottage food operation that receives covered products solely for use as an ingredient to manufacture um, a, a something else, an uncovered product, a combination food product. And an end user is also a restaurant or food facility or other business that only cooks and serves covered product to consumers or to customers, patrons, or guests for purposes of consumption. So Again, um, the retail store that, you know, we all shop at our neighborhood grocery store, that grocery store, that physical location is an end user. Um, a restaurant supply company that supplies food to restaurants for restaurants to cook, um, the restaurant is an end user. And so the, the company that's supplying to the restaurants, that would be the distributor. And then food processing facilities. If a food process, so for example, if a food processing facility here in California is making um, salad dressing and they use liquid eggs as an ingredient, then um, they are an end user as a food processing facility. They would need to buy compliant liquid eggs to make their salad dressing here in California. Okay, and a distributor um, can be a split operation. So distributors, the definition is um, the distributor is selling or distributing to an end user in California. So distributors can be in California or they could be outside of California. It could happen either way. It just, the definition is if you're selling or distributing to an end user in California. And so we recognize that for that reason, and then also because um, transshipment of non-compliant covered product can occur within California, um, there might be distributors which fall under the definition of a split operation, meaning they have compliant and non-compliant covered product at their warehouse location. And so during um, the third party certification, this would be checked and, and verified as far as um, Let's say it's a it's a large um, you know retailer and in California um, that has locations inside and outside of California, and they have a huge internal warehouse distribution center here in California. Um, they would register as a distribu distributor, and if they are bringing any non-compliant covered product in to California, that then kind of just like goes back out as far as. You know, you know, stuff moves. So it's coming in from Iowa and it goes to this distribution center in California, but then there is some of it that then just moves back out to Arizona or Nevada, for example. Um, that non compliant product is allowed to come in if then it just moves back out with any further, without any like packaging, repackaging, or anything like that. And so that in that example, the distribution warehouse would be certified as a split operation and they would have to show during their on-site inspection, hey, this is how we keep the compliant and non-compliant covered products separate. This is how we ensure that, you know, the California product, that's what stays here in California to be sold and the non-compliant product that doesn't enter California commerce. All right, so as I mentioned, distributor registration, it's, it's already required. Um, there's no fee to register. There isn't a, a fee penalty if you haven't registered yet. We're just encouraging um, registration. And each facility location is required to register separately. Um, so that means each location that um, does any physical uh, distribution, you would have to fill out a separate application for each each distribution hub. And the application is on our homepage under the forms and applications tab. And again, this registration expires um, 12 months after date of issue. So it's renewed annually. We do have guidance on our website um, as far as understanding the process of registration, who needs to register, trying to help you figure that out. 
it's under the distribution tab of um, on our guidance page. And then we also put together a YouTube tutorial that walks you through how to complete the distributor registration and, and how to submit it electronically. So certification of distributors. So right now, um, you know, fill out the application to be a registered distributor, send it into CDFA. If everything is complete, then your registration is, is granted. Um, but after January 1st of 2024, any new application for registration and then any um, renewal application for registration that's submitted to CDFA also has to be accompanied with a third party certification. Again, this could be issued either by a Perry Johnson or another accredited certifying agent. Um, it could be done by CDFA or another recognized government entity. And so thinking about the timing of this, or if you're a distributor, you know, if you um, are already, say you registered in um, January, say you registered, well, let's see, say you registered in December of 2022, so then your renewal is going to come up in this coming December of 2023. You could renew your registration in December of 2023. Good, you don't need it. You wouldn't need a third party certification at that point. But if you registered anytime in 2023, so say you registered in um, January of 2023, you're going to renew this coming January of 2024. Then when you submit your application for renewal, you also are going to have to submit um, your third docu evidence of your uh, third party certification that's been performed. So as far as that January 1st, 2024 deadline for distributor certification, it really um, how it relates to you and your business, it's going to be when did you register and when are you going to be due to renew? Okay, and so the third party certification, this is, you know, a question we really get a lot is what, what does that entail? What do I need to do to be prepared? Um, so a separate third party certification is going to be required for each location that is registered. So again, each, each location um, that distributes is going to register separately and then each location that's registered would need a separate third party certification. It does include an on site inspection. And again, this third party certification is renewed annually as well. Um, the process of this, so you can see at the bottom there, we have a list of certifying agents on our website. Again, Perry Johnson is an accredited certifying agent. Um, so the distributor um, selects who they wanna work with. So distributor picks their certifying agent distributor reach, reaches out to that certifying agent. Everything is done directly with the certifying agent. Um, if, if, you know, if, if someone wants to change, you, they have the right to pick someone else to perform their certifications. It's really the exchange is between the, the company and the accredited certifying agent. And then due to the accreditation process, you know, it's, it's clear as far as any of the certifying agents that are accredited, the ones that are allowed to perform these Prop 12 certifications, there is assurance written in as far as due process for any of the operations. So I have the example there, denial, suspension, or revocation of a certification are subject to due process, including a distributor's right to appeal the decision. And that's written into our regulations and all of our accredited certifying agents you know, understand that process. Um, and it is publicly listed on our website as far as all the accredited certifying agents. And then we also recently added, um, just for transparency with any of our foreign um, producers, you know, all of the foreign countries that the certifying agents will perform these services. And as far as the third party certification as a distributor, you know, what would Perry Johnson be looking for? Um, there are record keeping requirements. So it would be reviewing uh, the distributor's records, um, which includes the shipping document markings. As I mentioned, you know, it would be product coming into a distributor, product going out, any of the BOL shipping documents, they would need to have the correct statement on them. And then evidence, um, that the distributor is, you know, 
distributing compliant product, and this is demonstrated through um, a traceability exercise as far as the covered product that the distributor has, it can be traced back to a producer that is also certified. And we have on our website a newer guidance we put together for everyone to review. It's the on-site inspection guidance, and this is specific for distributors. So this is to review and familiarize yourself with in regards to during the on-site inspection for a third-party certification. This is everything that's going to be checked and reviewed by like a Perry Johnson. Okay, and then I, I mentioned this as far as, you know, the facilities that are under mandatory inspection under FSIS, they're not required to register as a distributor. So you think about, okay, well, if there's no registered distributor, how do we ensure compliant product? Um, so there are certain requirements here for retailers or food processing facilities. Um, if they are purchasing co covered product directly, from an FSIS plant, meaning the meat is purchased directly or the liquid eggs is purchased directly from an FSIS plant and there's no distributor in that supply chain, there's no registered distributor, then the, um, the responsibility is then put on the retailer or the food processing facility to maintain certain records. And so this is in our regulations. Um, so they have to maintain records documenting written certifications of covered product received during the preceding 12 month period. They have to maintain records documenting the address of the location where the retailer or food processor as the buyer took physical possession of the covered product. And then these records would need to be made available uh, by review for, for CDFA to review upon you know, our request that we need to review them. And so, again, this is the assurance that, again, we want to have a fair marketplace in California. Law applies to everyone. And if there isn't a distributor within the supply chain, um, meaning the retailer food processor is buying directly from an FSIS plant, then there are more responsibilities from a record keeping requirement for that retailer or food processor um, for them to be able to defend and show that they're buying compliant product. And then if you're a retail chain with multiple retail locations, um, so, you know, large national chain or even just a California chain, um, if you're a big grocery store, you have lots of retail locations, um, each of those retail locations is not required to register because each of those retail locations is considered an end user. But any internal distribution warehouses are considered distributors and those need to register with CDFA and then follow the same process of being third party certified in 2024. Um, and this is, this is a common question we get. And the reason that this is, is because of the definition of um, distributor, it's commercial sales or distribution to an end user. So those internal distribution warehouses are distributing to end users. They're distributing um, to their retail locations. And then it is um, when distributors register with CDFA, it is um, publicly available online. We currently have 930 registered distributors. Um, and so you can go to our website. I say there for an end user, anyone to review in regards to um, uh, the companies that are registered to um, be distributors here in California. And so with that, I just wanted to, to show our website a little bit more for everyone. I know it's a lot of information. And so this is our homepage. If you Google um, animal care program, CDFA, Prop 12 animal care, any combination of that, it, it pops up. Um, and so here on our homepage, um, we have some information. We have links to recent court rulings. Um, you can find us on social media. Here at the top on the right, you can click um, to, subscribe, to subscribe to our Prop 12 listserv for email updates. Um, here's a link to our regulations, a link to the statute, to the law. 
Here's the link to um, the distributor registration uh, application. Here's a link to the list of um, registered distributors. This is updated weekly. And then the link to our certifying agents. We, we just update this as, as needed as additional certifying agents come online. Um, but the most important tab for you guys would be this guidance document tab. So, or link on the side on the right here. So click on guidance documents. And this is where you can find the things I was talking about today. Um, so all stakeholders is where we have important dates, um, frequently asked questions, the regulatory framework, the guidance for sale under Prop 12. And then we also have ones for distributors, which talks about the different covered products, shipping documents, and then ones for producers, um, certifying agents, and then also specific to what did I just say, fairs and exhibitions and specific to certifying agents. And then we did do, if you want more content, we did do um, you know, some webinars back in June. You can watch those on demand. Um, and then we were working on more tutorials, but these are the short tutorial videos as well that we've put together. And then I'll just leave it with, um, under the all stakeholders tab, um, again, this important dates document this is one I share with stakeholders a lot, but you know, just to emphasize the upcoming date um, for producers and distributors as far as needing that third party certificate of compliance. And with that, um, I talked longer than I expected, but I am happy to answer some questions if there's questions that have come in. All right, awesome. Uh, we do have a few minutes left for questions. So if anyone has anything last minute to submit, go ahead. Uh, I do have one question. This was submitted a bit earlier, so it may have been covered before. Um, but the question is, if we have a distribution point in the middle of our supply chain that's only used for redistribution, does that need to be audited? It is not shipped direct to consumers. It's only a staging point. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. So no, that wouldn't fall under the definition of, of, of a distributor that needs to register with CDFA. So it's only the distributors that are selling or distributing directly to an end user here in California. Those are the ones that need to register. Yes, if it, it's a staging area, it's just going to another distribution center. No, that type of location would not need to register or be certified. Okay, well, that was the one question we had and we're wrapping up on time here. So thank you so much, Liz. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending the webinar and also encourage everyone to check out some of these resources that she mentioned. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you.